Our contestants will be given a basket of ingredients that no one knows till now and they will have to create a masterpiece in under 30 minutes. The main thing about Macaulay was that it really allowed me to take a lot of internships because I didn't have to worry about that huge tuition bill coming in. Activism and, and contributing to the world and being a part of society is something that I can't seem to reconcile with painting. Welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show about cutie. I'm Despina Maris. The New York City College of Technology is well known for its hospitality management and culinary arts programs. Let's meet a famous alumnus who whips up a sweet surprise for the winner of a cooking competition. And we assure you, both the contest and the chef are strictly kosher. Show of hands, anyone not feel up to the test? CKCA, the Center for Kosher Culinary Arts. We have previewed hundreds upon hundreds of entries, and we have whittled it down to what we feel is the best three contestants. Our challenges include brain work, hand-eye coordination. We have speed challenges. Our contestants will be given a basket of ingredients that no one knows till now. And they will have to create a masterpiece in under 30 minutes. The winner is going to receive a $5,000 scholarship for the professional class at the Center for Kosher Culinary Arts. My wife and I, we always dance around in our head that one day we would open a little bed and breakfast years down the road. My goal right now is maybe try to start a catering business and um, write a cookbook. And Los Angeles is not as great as New York when it comes to kosher food, so I'd love to open up something. It's a bit overwhelming. We'll see how it goes. I'm excited to have fun with it. All my family is like, oh my god, you have to win. You know, I'm one of five kids, so it's not so easy to send us all to school. The kitchen so far looks pretty intimidating. I feel like I'm on Top Chef and that's exciting. I just can't wait to see what we're actually doing. I have a cookbook in my car. <laughs> I haven't been told much. Hopefully I win. Hope I win. <laughs> Welcome. The first part of your challenge is going to be a written challenge. Chef Camerly is our lead culinary instructor from Alsace. On your marks. Get set, go! I wasn't able to finish. It was a little harder than I expected, actually. Pretty nerve-wracking. I skipped to the essay part, because that's where the creativity part came in. So hopefully that was some bonus points for me. Yeah, I actually forgot there was essays until about two minutes before. And I did not think there was going to be any math on the test. It sounds like everybody else was equally as challenged as I was, so. I, at least I got the essays done in the end. I skipped some of the pages. We'll see. Not so good. Your first task is to separate 10 eggs. The egg whites then have to be whipped up to a nice fluffy meringue. Challenge number two. Each table has six to seven carrots. They need to be peeled. They need to be sliced. We're using a mandolin slicer on them. Our third challenge. You must write the center for kosher culinary arts. Three on one paper, three on your second paper. Our fresh black sea bass. If you get one of these spines in your finger, it's guaranteed instant infection. So be careful. We're going to make one cut in the belly cavity of this fish. The guts are going to come out. Oh yeah. Guts come out. Next, we're going to take a fish scaler and very carefully 
Remove all the scales. Both sides of the fish. Got it? We'll be working with sharp knives and even sharper mandolins. Be careful, we don't want anyone getting injured today. Please assume your position. Ladies and gents, go down. the competition, I'll continue. Great moments in CUNY history. William Hallett Green in 1884 became City College's first African-American graduate. The 19-year-old scholar had his heart set on joining the United States Signal Corps, the Army's precursor to the National Weather Service. Though eminently qualified, Green's application was rejected by Signal Corps Commander General William Hazen. Not willing to accept defeat, Green turned to City College President Alexander Webb and Secretary of War Robert Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's son. With their recommendations, Green was accepted into the U.S. Signal Corps, blazing yet another trail. This one for blacks in the military.
activism and, and contributing to the world and being a part of society in a good way uh, is something that I can't seem to reconcile with painting. So Occupy Wall Street um, and Occupy Queens fills that need for me. I knew going into college that I wanted to study art. I've been drawing since I was two. My parents were like, you really need to apply to the Honors College. And I signed up to get a Bachelor's of Fine Arts. And then I finally graduated after five years. <laughs> So what I'm working on right now is a, a new series of work where I continue to explore the, the difference between opposites. So I've been collecting these saint statues and I paint them either white or either black. This one uh, a friend bought me and it's already white so I don't have to deal with painting it. And this is Saint Francis of Assisi. And then this is Mary, I found her in, she's part of a nativity scene, but I painted her all black. And then Mary, because she's all black, will go in a black box and I will make a painting of her in the black box. And St. Francis will go in a white box because I'm interested in making objects invisible and sort of bringing them closer to the, the sphere of a shadow. I started reading uh, Milan Kundera and in his novel, Unbearable Lightness of Being, there's this point where he talks about how um, the opposites are really intimates and they're not as different as we think they are. The object can't exist without the shadow, and the shadow can't exist without the object. So they're not actually opposites, they're, they're codependents. This interest in, in how, um, how things that seem to conflict are maybe actually the same thing, or maybe they're really dependent on each other, is something that I've realized um, is actually like the guiding force and the central force of my entire life. Through painting and through everything else in my life, I'm looking to escape that dialectic and, and find a way where we can have you know, more than just these two opposing forces. If we look at it more um, concretely, like through the lens of something like Occupy Wall Street, you have, you're either like, the 1% or the 99%, or even in terms of political parties, you're Democrat or Republican. It's really about like just getting rid of this like push and pull and this tug of war between only two things. I think it just broadens the way that you think and you look at the world. Because if you think that there are only these two opposing forces, north and south, black and white, up and down, right and wrong, things like that, it, it limits your thinking. It limits just what you can bring to any situation in life. I think it victimizes people because if, if you decide that you're on, on the side that um, is not being favored, if you're on the shadow side, well, that's it. <laughs> you know, there, there's no other option for you. You either have to become an object, which is something that you're not, or you have to stay a shadow and you have to deal with the dominance of the object over you. Before Occupy Wall Street, I was really apolitical. Um, I was kind of like an ostrich. I was very apathetic. I was like, the world is screwed up. Everything is just falling to pieces, but there's really nothing I can do. I can pound my head against the wall as much as I want, and I'm not going to make any change. I'm just going to exhaust myself. Part of Occupy Wall Street is um, using the consensus process where it's not this, this Nietzschean dialectic and this fight between my idea and your idea and whose idea is better, my idea is better. So bam, there goes your idea. Good evening and welcome to the General Assembly of Occupy Queens. The General Assembly aims to facilitate discussion so that we can find common ground and reach compromise. Instead of choosing one idea over another, We'll all work together to create an idea that's better than the ideas that we would have made on our own and to create an idea that everyone agrees with. So much of um, any Occupy, be it Wall Street or Queens, is about changing the way that we look at the world, changing the way that we communicate with each other. Um, you know, are we fighting with people? Are we having debates all the time? Or are we having conversations? Um, are we really listening to people? Uh, do we feel empowered to make a change in our world? This is what occupying is about for me. You know, I don't know how that's going to play out politically, um, but I think that it's, it's about changing the conversation. It's about changing the way that we look at and perceive the world and communicate within it. And um, those are things that we will continue to be doing for a long time coming. Still up on Study with the Best, Macaulay Honors College marks an important milestone. But first, this message from the Chancellor. Stay with us.
Hi, I'm Chancellor Matthew Goldstein, pleased to present CUNY's 2011 Student All-Star Team. In the infield, Barium Goldwater scholar Mark Barriman, National Science Foundation fellows Lena Mercedes Gonzalez and Arthur Jacob Parzignat, and Truman scholar Gareth Rhodes. In the outfield, National Science Foundation scholar Ryan Jaipal, Barium Goldwater scholar Celine Joiry, and Fulbright grant recipient Miguel Guzman. Behind home plate, Truman scholar Iodella Oti. On the pitcher's mound, Rhodes scholar Zujasha Takir. In the bullpen, Joseph Camarada, Barium Goldwater Scholar, and Funleo Easterwood, Fulbright Hayes Grant recipient, and designated hitters, Math for America fellows, Gian Liu and Anne-Marie Alcocer. CUNY All-Stars, like the Yankees, our hometown champions. I'm Carol Ann Riddell at Macaulay Honors College on the Upper West Side. Tonight the school is celebrating its first decade and highlighting some amazing success stories. Take a look. Ten years and counting, Macaulay Honors College is marking a milestone. The school recently celebrated with an event honoring William and Linda Macaulay, whose multi-million dollar donation paved the way for the future. William Macaulay is also a CUNY graduate. Why did you choose to, to give so much to this program? Well, mainly because, as I think you know, I'm a graduate. Yes. And my circumstances were that if I hadn't gone here to get my college degree, I would not have gotten a college degree. So the first motivator was gratitude. Because without that degree, I wouldn't have been able to do what I've been able to do. I wouldn't have the money to have <laughs> donated the building. And so gratitude was my, my primary uh, first motivator. Macaulay students are selected based on top-notch academics and leadership potential. Each student receives a full tuition scholarship and other support. Just look at the data that was recently uh, released by the College Board. A trillion dollars in debt owed by students who have just graduated universities around the United States. Many of them have no jobs and it's a tremendous burden on them in starting their future. Here, we're giving some of those very bright students an opportunity in a highly competitive environment not to worry about the accumulation of debt, but at the same time not compromise the extraordinary opportunities that a university like this can give them. So I've really found that with this program, what you put in is what you get out of it, and that's exactly why I came here. How do you think it's made a difference for you specifically? Opportunities, I mean, they just throw them at you. Um, <laughs> Macaulay never ever gave up on our dreams, whether we were astrophysicists that loved musical theater or business majors that loved art, you know, we never gave up on our creative aspirations and we never gave up on our career aspirations and we do both really well. What would you say has made Macaulay the right place, a special place for you? I think for me it's been all the resources available in the CUNY system and what Macaulay really does for you is open up all the doors at all the different campuses. There are over I think 23 uh, so I've been able to take classes at all of them ranging from typography to social psychology to cognitive neuroscience. Well I always tell people the main thing about Macaulay was that it really allowed me to take a lot of internships because I didn't have to worry about that huge tuition bill coming in. So I could take the unpaid internships and I had about five internships by the time I graduated in different media organizations and that really got my career on track to start at WMT. I think it's an incredible, incredible experience. It's, a, it's, it's the winning of a lottery ticket, as I call it. First of all, the Honors College uh, attracts the smartest and the best, and the best in the system. Number two, you're in the greatest city in the world. Number three, you have your entire scholarship paid for in total. But the real accomplishments, they really have to do with our students, um, with our extraordinarily talented 1600 student body. Um, you know, I could single out so many of them, but um, to think that we've gone from a new college to two Rhodes Scholars in our first, you know, couple of years, I think is really pretty amazing. Why is it so important for us as a city, for us as a society, really, to have this kind of institution for those students? Well, you put your money where your mouth is as a culture and as a society. And what CUNY is doing is saying that the support of these wonderfully talented students is important for the future of New York, and that's where CUNY is investing its, its money. And they're already beginning to give back um, as wonderful citizens of New York, 
working in leading organizations and not-for-profits, going to graduate school, becoming doctors, they will make us all very, very proud. Ambition, smarts, and dedication, just some of the qualities that distinguish the students here. We'll look forward to watching Macaulay Honors College flourish for the next decade. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Study with the Best. home. They say it's where the heart is. Well, my heart is beating a jungle rhythm of pure concrete mixed with snow and sleet. It beats a fast-paced jamboree matched only by the pulse of a city that never acknowledges insomnia. Why bother? Ice runs through this home city veins, tracked by IRT trains that carry its lifeblood without much disdain. This is home, <laughs> where the heart is. But sometimes, Sometimes my heart beats a different beat, a different rhythm. And when it decides to change that pattern, sometimes home, sometimes home changes the heart. Because home is where the heart is, and the heart knows where it's wanted, and sometimes where it's wanted isn't where the head is. So what to do? Make a move, make a shift. Such a well-made plans adrift. Why hide? Take it in stride. And buy a heart a e-ticket to ride. And fly. And when this land of luxury Besides, it's had its way with me, and in there it's gone. And when the opportunity comes to get the best of me, that is when I go. That is when I go. Then home suddenly changes. It suddenly rearranges what you thought was routine. Come on, come clean. You thought that early mornings of coffee callings and subway stallings was the order of the day? But today, you're on the road, nice and easy, soulful and breezy. Today, the order is a rich green landscape, beauty you can't escape, and a climate of tropical energy in which you just want your body to be draped. You can't escape that feeling, that wondrous sense of bliss you're feeling. Ha, ah, boy, that is home, partner. And in this land of destiny, they can be so mean to me, she could give real home. They destroy better men than me. When she put she eye on me, well, Lord, I go. That is when I go. That is when I go. And then memories come. Memories of missing your shows on Saturday morning because you had to go to the market and help with Tanti shopping. I didn't know it then, but images of provision, dashing bush and yam, helped shape me into the man that I am. All that natural food from the earth that I had digested since birth is a representation of my own gestation. For I, island boy with big city dreams, came onto these shores to lace crops with cream. You see, I still feel rhythm that concrete jungle rhythm. But not all concrete have to be that urban terrain where you beat your feet. Ah boy, where you bop your head to hip hop dread. You could have some room for soak and clips in your head. A sweet pan melody to get you through the day. It put a smile on your face and get you on your way. Walk down the street and not feel the heat of eight million people trying not to be elite. I say today, make a home of where you stay. But if home happened to be far, far away, bring home to you dread bring home to you. And when my friends and family reach out their loving hands to me and my soul feels warm. They give me constant energy and when they send and call for me, well I go. That is when I go. That is when I go. This man presides over a $100 million food empire. Where did he cook up his recipe for success? CUNY.
My name is Laurel Hawthorne. I'm the president and CEO of Golden Cross Caribbean Bakery and Grill. We manufacture eight different style Jamaican patties. We also manufacture the best jerk chicken on the planet and several pastry items and hors d'oeuvre bread. The Golden Cross story is a story about hard work. It's about family. It's a great immigrant story. A story that begins in 1981 when Lowell came here from the West Indies and enrolled in Bronx Community College. Study accounting and, and business administration. All the while keeping his job as an NYPD stockroom assistant and eventually NYPD accountant. But armed with his mother's recipes, Lowell never gave up his dream of establishing his parents' bakery business in the United States. Fortunately, my family bought into the idea, they bought into the concept, they mortgage a home, uh, pull all their saving out, and to start the very first bakery on Gunnell Road in the Bronx. Many bakeries later, it's still very much a family affair. Lowell's 10, count them, 10 brothers and sisters, plus Lowell, his wife Lorna, their three sons and a daughter, plus assorted other family members, all work for Golden Crust, either at the Bronx corporate headquarters or at branch offices in Atlanta, Fort Lauderdale, and Miami. Once we started the first bakery, of course we've experienced tremendous challenges, whether it was um, importation laws, equipment problems, finding the right employees. Having overcame all those hurdles, we were able to open up approximately 17 bakeries in five years. And then everyone wanted in. And we were approved as a franchisor in May of 1996 and the rest is history. 122 franchise locations in nine states, the franchise is employing 1,800 people. Who is your target consumer? The vision of the organization is to ensure that Jamaican patties become mainstream by 2020. What are we doing? One, the products can now be found in Costco's. I live in Westchester County. We do have a store in White Plains, New York, where the demographic is, is basically mostly Caucasian, and that is one of our business stores in the Golden Cross Systems. So it tells me that um, the demographic is changing rapidly. And it all started with a humble beef patty. That's it. Yeah, many individuals saw patties as a, as, a, as a meal, but I saw patty as an opportunity to make money and do well and help others fuel their entrepreneurial spirit. Barry Mitchell, study with the best. Thanks for watching Study with the Best. For all things CUNY, log on to CUNY.edu or find us on Facebook and Twitter at CUNY TV. I'm Despina Maris. See you next time. People are more particular about their eggs than any other style of food. You are going to have 10 minutes to make as many orders of fried eggs over easy. We're going to ask Chef Camille to start a clock on your mark, please. I'll be ready. The ghost.